Okay, everybody. It is the 7th of July, and it is Tuesday. I'm going to try and, and get through Chapter 7, I believe, or 8 on, on uh, international trade. Uh, Ricardo is the economist involved there, and um, uh, famously, uh, Mr. Krugman was uh, did his Nobel Prize winning work on trade. Um, and you can look that up and read it if you're interested in his work. All right. Um, we are right here, Inputs and Costs, uh, week six. So uh, four more weeks. I'm going to put up a an exam uh, in week nine for you to complete. It'll probably be something like 80 questions from the book um, with a few essays on my of my own. That, uh, so I'm going to make you write a little bit uh, so that you sort yourselves out and I can do some grading um, despite my reluctance uh, to, you know, give grades. And, and again, don't be nervous. You're going to do fine. Uh, the, uh, here's my, that's my channel. I don't know why I'm on that. But, um, I wanted to go to here. I did put up a... Uh, not an assignment, but an announcement today. I saw a great article in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> As I often do, um, and I put op-ed there, um, I, great to your understanding is that, that op-ed is op-ed. Opinion editorial. Uh, and ed editorial is an essay written on behalf of the editor. Who's the editor? Well, every newspaper has an editor or... or Famously, uh, you know, the New York Times editorial board. There's a board of editors that are supposed to be doing their job and editing. <laughs> um, same thing at the Wall Street Journal. Um, excuse me. Um, editorials and essay written on behalf of the editor pertaining to some topical issue. In this case, uh, campus culture seizes the streets. This was more of a piece uh, by John Ellis talking about a book that he did. And I think I, I, I listened to John in a, um, right here, Reforming Higher Ed with John Ellis, just, just so I could get a feel of who he is. Uh, and I wanted to hear him talk, which is the miracle of uh, YouTube. You're able to go and, you know, is this guy full of crap? What, you know, what's, what is the story with him? Uh, I also looked up his curriculum vita, which is uh, the academic term, I suppose, for your um, uh, resume. And he's well written. And uh, he is, in fact, a professor emeritus of German literature, of all things. But he noticed some things over his career. You can see he's an older man. Uh, and and as, uh, wisdom, we call that wisdom. <laughs> and I'm going to explain what that means. I think the beauty of, of what we have, I was telling this to my dad this morning on our market call as I put this little thing together, was that um, my, my dad is really wise. He, he had, you know, a 44-year career and, and raised three children with my mom and, and had a marriage with my mom, which is quite a hurdle, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> love her. <laughs> God rest her soul. But uh, the, the idea that, that uh, if you have opinions today, your opinions aren't worth anything is not true. I don't, I don't want to say that. And I, I certainly hope I don't intimate that. But let's just say that they're... Um, Immature, not in, in, in the idea that you're not men or women, but immature in the fact that maybe you haven't done the reading and, and uh, done some of the things that others have done. Uh, that doesn't mean their opinions are correct. Uh, but uh, if, if you're going to, uh, it will just follow me on this and you'll, you'll, <laughs> and, and then again, it, that's why the beauty of, of what my dad and I were talking about. I said, well, the beauty of community colleges, I know that. In this class alone, there's some, some older students, and uh, it's not like being at Harvard where everyone is an undergrad is is 18 to 22, and 
um, you know, don't, don't have the voice of experience. So it's great in our discussions uh, when, when people come in and say, well, you know, after 25 years in the work, working, I think this, you know, and, and, and that, that has weight. That, that's not something to be ignored. You ignore that at your peril when, when someone says, well, you know, I've been, I've, I've been thinking about this for, you know, I've been thinking about the declaration for, you know, 25, 30 years. Uh, I may, um, and, and, I, and that doesn't mean think about it all the time. It might be once a year, but nonetheless, uh, they may have more time thinking about it than you have, and that's worth something. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, dismiss people at your peril. And dismiss people uh, for having one opinion on one thing and, you know, like Steven Pinker, who I love, uh, um, and his book about, uh, he wrote a number of books I think I showed to you, but he's lectured extensively on how good things are in the United States and the world right now. Uh, and but he and I, I I'm not an atheist and he is yet I would be honored to meet him I, I don't just dismiss his work because he's atheist and I'm not um, and and I hope I, I feel pretty certain given his demeanor and and his writing that he he would do the same uh, and not dismiss me because uh, you know just say well he's a Jesus freak and the hell with him you know I, that's really narrow-minded so Anyway, I, I wrote this little thing, op-ed. Remember, op-ed. It's an op. I I, I put an op-ed on the pages of an academic uh, on Canvas for you to look at. That doesn't mean that uh, you, you can agree or disagree. Uh, I happen to think that the the man who wrote this is correct, um, and he has data and things that go along with it. But uh, there you are. There's an important difference between opinion writing and reporting. Um, supposedly our newspapers and media outlets are supposed to report the news uh, that it, it should be factual um, but on an op-ed page that's when you get to uh, put your opinion out there um, again I start right here I, I, I start the course with John Stuart Mills on Liberty that's a book it's here somewhere here it is on Liberty this is this is a look at tiny book you can finish it in an afternoon literally in an afternoon um, I started for a reason the short book provides us with so many treasured quotes and ideas should be required reading I clearly uh, for high school seniors um, and then I put a few quotes from Mill there the most important one uh, the one that I always said uh, he who knows only his side of a case knows little of that his reasons may be good and no one may have been able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion, either, either, nor is it enough that he should hear the opinions of adversaries from his own teachers presented as they state them and accompanied by what they offer as refutations. This is sort of like listening to me talk about Krugman. Go read Krugman. <laughs> or, or if you, you know, if you think that Austrians are crazy, go read Human Action. Read this book. Ooh, ooh, there's my camera. Read this book. This, this, you know, this is uh, sort of uh, where we're headed with with Human Action, Praxeology. Uh, and I found a website for that, not a website, but a, a YouTube channel for that book online with two young people discussing it. That's pretty interesting. If you're curious about that book, um, <laughs> it's a lot longer than John Stuart Mill. So uh, I know people who are, there's like a club of people who've actually read the book. Uh, <laughs> it's a small club. Uh, anyway. The end of Mill says he he must he must be able to hear from them from persons who actually believe them. So it's one thing to hear a critique of Krugman from me, who's been critiquing Krugman ever since I began to see the holes in the argument. Um, but but hearing them from Krugman himself would be much better because he actually believes what he says. Uh, I think he must know them in order 
in their most plausible and persuasive form. And that means, uh, you know, you get plenty of that on the other side of economics with, with the way things are now. Now this, this before I get into the lecture, I'm, I'm going to start on chapter eight. Um, taxpayers, parents, and donors. Um, this is so important. This man, how, how did radical ideas in abolishing or defunding the police move from the fringes to official policy seemingly overnight? Uh, after George Floyd's killing by police touched off protests, why did so many prominent journalists and intellectual rationalize looting and violence? Um, obviously, the people I listened to did not. You know, the Glenn Lowry's and John McCormick's and Tom Soule's and and those the, those thinkers um, in in the in the black community they did not they they did not rationalize looting and violence, and I I don't either. Um, two wrongs don't make a right. That's what we teach our children that immediately. You, I mean, there's certain iconic phrases like that that it doesn't matter whether you're religious or not. When you, you're going to come to that place with your child where they're going to say, you know, you know, Annie on the playground said this to me. I'm not going to say to Alice, well, you go do the same thing back to her. No, you, what you say is if, if Alice is bent on revenge, I say that we we don't do revenge in this family. It's not right. Two wrongs don't make a right. So uh, that's such an important concept. It's it's just as important as the golden rule: do unto others as as you would do unto as they would do unto you. Um, you know that that's not as you would have them do unto you. <laughs> I'm so, my my dad used to say the, the code of the West: do unto others before they do unto you. No, we no wrong, wrong. Do unto others as you would have them. Uh, you know, so treat treat people as you want to be treated. You know that sort of idea, the golden rule. Um, anyway, a well-known professional standard for college professors warns against quote. And this is an old quote, so it's sexist to sell. Taking unfair advantage of the student's immaturity, or <laughs> not only that, it's condescending. Student's immaturity by indoctrinating him with the teacher's own opinions before the student has an opportunity fairly to examine other opinions upon the matters in question. And this is what I was getting at. You know, what have you read? You know, before you have, have, you, have you read all the Federalist Papers? Have you read, uh, I put a link. I put a link here to uh, what the founding fathers were reading in those days. Considering our discussion of tyranny, it might be useful for you to read or at least know what the founders were talking about back in those days in, in, in the uh, 1600s. Um, and there's a the list of a bibliography sort of of, of what, um, what historians have put together. So what... <laughs> What are the, taking unfair advantage um, before you're able to examine your own opinions. Why, why am I so careful with this? Um, and before he has sufficient knowledge and ripeness of judgment. What does that mean? Ripeness of judgment. Well, ripe means um, ready, right? If it's a fruit, we all know when it's ripe. It's not green anymore. Why do they call people who are new to something green? Well, they're green means they're not ripe. Um, so ripeness of judgment means means that they're fully and in full fruit. They, their judgment is good to be entitled to form any definitive opinion on his own, right? So you, you, you don't, if you're sitting in a class and they're saying um, climate change is real and that's that and it's settled science, that's not teaching. That's not teaching. That's that's indoctrination. Um, that statement, this statement here, came from the American Association of University Professors, 1915. That was written. Now look at look at Cali. Now, typical example: California's Constitution. California has its own Constitution because it's the United States of America, not the United State. Um, so they have their own Constitution. Believe it or not. That's why they can leave. Uh, that the University of California shall be entirely independent of all political or sectarian influence and kept free therefrom. Therefrom is a great word, isn't it? Therefrom. 
Where from? Political and sectarian influences. What are sectarian influences? Catholicism is a sectarian influence. Um, Judaism, right? Uh, political, when, when in, at my college, at my institution, they sent out an email to get the vote out with a link to a clearly le leftist um, get out the vote uh, uh, website last year, or last election, right? <laughs> they wanted to get out the vote for Hillary is what they wanted to do. And somebody, there's one more guy like me, a libertarian, he's up in... Uh, Steve Barton, I, I love him already. Alan, his name, he's a great guy, right? Uh, also teaches economics, go figure. And uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but he, 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 wrote a, he wrote a great, I wish I could show you that chain. I, I, I don't feel comfortable, but it was, he lit him up, you know, he lit him up and said, uh, you can't do that. We don't do that here. If, you know, no more than I would, you know, hook you up with a some kind of right-wing get out the vote plan I indoctrinate you that way you want to go vote go vote might be wasting your time but whatever mm. uh, but I'm not telling you who to vote for I'm just telling you I'm voting for Joanne Jurgensen this time <laughs> because I think she's the shit um, anyway uh, typical example their constitution spells this out. So that's important. Um, and he goes on to talk about uh, some numbers here. Where, where does it go? And, and what can be done about it? It's so important um, to, to get both sides of the story. Here it is. Uh, political radicalism was rampant amongst graduate students who became junior professors, instantly sh shifting the fact faculty sharply leftward. I talked about this already, so I don't want to beat a dead horse, but um, so important when you when you uh, begin to. It's really fun to be around everybody who's talking and doing the same thing and everybody's, you know, marching in the same direction. Um, I'm, I, I'm giving a shriek for freedom and telling you to, to question everything, including me. I hope you, I'm pretty sure that's going on. <laughs> the weirder I appear as as time goes by um, but question your your other professors too and and say that to them you know when, when you feel afraid uh, because you don't think you're gonna get, get a grade or something because I've been there I mean my the ink's not dry on my MBA um, but I just I don't know I turned 50 and I was like fuck it um, but excuse my language you you can you can frame it that way and, and, and say, you know, in the interest of heterodoxy, professor, what do you know about the other side of that argument? Um, global warming. What, what do you know about the science of, of the deniers? And if they know nothing about it, uh, you know, mark that down in your head, you know, say, say well, gee, I, you know an awful lot about why this was the hottest year on record, but you know nothing about... Um, you know, some of the physicists that have come up with other theories such as, you know, uh, solar eruptions and, and, and uh, uh, cloud cover and water vapor and, and all the other things that I've read about that, that led me to the conclusion that there's, this is way too complex and uh, we shouldn't be spending all of our time uh, worrying about it. So anyhow, onward. Let's talk... Let's talk international trade. Uh, and I think I have Ricardo here. I've got a number of books here. I, I put my little bookshelf up over here today. Um, and I've got, uh, I don't know, people are asking me about books and I still haven't written them down, but everything in my office is put away. I have a giant bookshelf over there, but all these cabinets behind me are filled with books because we're showing this house. And it's, I'm, I feel like I get anxiety when my books aren't around. Uh, but anyway, here's, um, here's Ricardo. Uh, th this is a book my sister got me uh, some time ago on, on uh, international trade and, and uh, taxation. But it's works of, of David Ricardo. And um, that's a really, that, that's one of my favorite books. 
So international trade, what are we going to talk about? Comparative advantage, right? Um, and Chinese internet improves the welfare of Chinese smartphone producers as well as American consumers, right? Everybody makes out. This is the idea behind it, and, and Krigman was, you know, absolutely, everybody's right on this one. There's no, <laughs> no question. Um, and you can even think of, uh, you know, we're desert island kind of stuff. There's three of us on a desert island. Somebody's going to be better at fishing, period. You know, maybe my reactions are better and I catch more fish. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there's people who are really good at fishing in this valley. I know that. Uh, uh, I'm not one of them. Uh, or golf or, you know, I don't know. Uh, but there's some things that I'm okay at. International trade is more important for the United States than it used to be and more important for some countries than others. I would try, I'm going to jelly ranch it. I probably shouldn't. But my throat is a little dry. Um, international trade is more important, right? And, and you can see in these figures, uh, let me see if I can make that big. Oh, I don't want to move it. I want to make it big. Ooh, big er. Um, so you can see how, how trade moved all these years, right? Here, maybe I get it over here, make it better. Uh, and and here's percent of GDP, and this is going to 2014 from 1870. Right, and here, here's how much how much percent of the world GDP uh, was international trade, and see how it's gone up and up and up and up. Uh, so fantastic, right? You know that, that's a big deal, and it's and it means money. Uh, more important, hyper globalization. There's another twenty dollar word. What does it mean? I don't know. Uh, extremely high levels of international trade. Uh, you're going to see me rail against the WHO here and, and um, everything else. Free trade is the way to go. Um, I, I have very, I have a lot of trouble sticking up for tariffs and, and the game that we're playing now. It's, it's a bad idea all the way around. Um, chapter two, remember, <laughs> chapter two, country has a comparative advantage in producing a good or service, if the opportunity cost of producing that good or service is lower uh, for that country than for other countries. This is the Ricardian model, right? Uh, we assume the countries will specialize in goods they can produce more cheaply, right? We don't, I just, I made lunch for the girls, uh, Alice and her little friend Gianna, and uh, they're running around here somewhere. Um, we had watermelon and we had cherries and we had uh, pears and um, I'm I Gianna Gianna said <laughs> I should be ratting her out. She, she doesn't really like fruit that much. She just doesn't like fruit. I'm like that. Okay, yeah, I'm not one of these parents. Like eat your fruit. I could give a shit. You know, and that, that, there's there's no kids dying of scurvy around here. You know, here's a Flintstone vitamin. Go go forth. And so. Uh, if she just want to eat meat and quesadillas, I could give a shit. But anyhow, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. The, <laughs> or, but if you're going to be a parent, uh, trade follows the Ricardian model. Why don't we have, when, when they, when the Nislanics who started this college, Jim Nislanic and, and, and some others, their father drug, you know, drug oxen in here and drug horses and, it came here. There was no fruit. There was no nothing. There was there wasn't. Maybe they brought in their wagons some seeds for apples, and, and knowing back then that that scurvy was a thing, uh, maybe they brought some stuff with them to to uh, do that, just as they did. You know, the Puritans did when they when they went across the ocean from England. They brought things with them to introduce into the uh into the 13 colonies and they call that you know <laughs> these days we call it, that's an invasive species and they should have left all that in europe yeah well bullshit then we wouldn't have we wouldn't have the wonderful fruits and things that we have here or, or 
champagne. Do you know when they had a blight and did did uh oh I can't remember whether Murray talked about it. they had a blight in in France and, and a grape blight and it killed all their grapes. You know what they did to get the champagne going again? They came here and, and took grapes from here. They came from France. <laughs> They're just going back. You know, so that that's trade. That's the beauty of it. Oh, so we we specialize in goods more cheaply. We they can they, they can grow uh, watermelons better in California due to soils, due to the uh, degree days. That's that's a uh, metric that we use in in agriculture. Uh, this year, if you notice, uh, it was very cold spring. We we didn't get the degree days that we normally get here, so the hay crop is shitty. Uh, so um, it, you can grow. You, we're not growing pineapples here. Um, we're not, you know, um, there are certain species of animals that don't do great here. So anyhow, specialization, that was just agriculture I was talking about. Of course, everything, you know, why, why do they make pianos in, in, uh, Germany? Why Steinway? I don't know. Why, why watches in Switzerland? Uh, they just, they just, uh, uh they, they get, they got a comparative advantage in those things. Autarky, very important. Here's the $20 word. Uh, if this situation, country doesn't trade with others. Okay. Each country has a different opportunity cost. It makes sense to specialize in trade. Right? And here we go with trucks and um, phones. Right? And we're working. Good. Trucks and phones. How do we get to the correct number? This is where in your, it's going to get a little mathy, but don't let it bother you. Um, just get the concepts. So with trade, the United States concentrates on producing trucks. China on phones, the total world production in both goods rises. It's possible for both countries to consume more of both. Uh, this, is, this is the idea that Ricardo tripped over was that uh, he didn't trip over it. He <laughs> studied it really carefully and realized that this was occurring, um, that with trade, you, you, everyone benefits, okay? Which is, to me, is just nothing but an extension of, of the miracle of capitalism and the miracle of free markets uh, is, you know, everybody wins. Everybody wins. It's the value proposition. Here's the big one for students. Don't confuse absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Uh, just because the United States can produce more of both goods doesn't mean we're better off without trade or we'd be making iPhones here. Uh, pay attention to opportunity costs. As always, all of these concepts work together. And, and what's, what is critical thinking is to be able to conjure some of these laws up when you need them and, and w when you're developing an argument in your own mind is to go, oh, wait a minute, what's the opportunity cost? If it's cheaper for China to produce phones than it is for the United States, U.S. will want to import phones. Yes, yes. So here's productivity and wages. Huh. Don't confuse productivity with, excuse me, the human aspect. Like, don't don't make the mistake of going, oh, people are really conscientious in Switzerland. And by conscientious, I mean the, the psychological five-trait model, conscientiousness. You know, that would put them, that would make them really productive. You know, uh, if it, high IQ and high conscientiousness almost guarantees you a good living. So... Uh, here we are in the United States. We're, we're here somewhere. This is wages, percent of U.S. wage. What percent of U.S. and productivity, percent of U.S. Pro productivity. It's all based on uh, United States as the benchmark. Okay. Um, 100, 100. See where they are mathematically? I, I could, wish I could draw on this. 100, 100, right? Get it? You know, so you, you can... Uh, I wonder if I can draw on this. Shape outline. Isn't there a animations? I'm going to figure that out today. I promise. 
Anyway, 100% is United States. Everything's down there. So uh, even though um, Switzerland is at like 180% of our wage, they're only at you know 82% of productivity. Well, what is productivity? Um, it's not just people in Switzerland are far more conscientious and people in the Philippines are really lazy. They're not. They're the same. Well, pretty much. You know, I mean, you, you could argue some cultural shit to me and I'll listen, uh, but that would be racist. So careful. Um, <laughs> but neither here nor there. Um, in the Philippines, productivity is low because they don't have machinery. They don't have tools and, and the stuff that maybe we have or they, they have in Switzerland. You know, you, you talk about productivity due to computerization, due to technology, the big T. It, it all boils down to the big T. Okay. So uh, anyway, look at the productivity in Singapore. Incredible. Uh, arguably, um, one of the most capitalistic societies there is. Singapore? Hmm, I don't know. Is there correlation? Uh, I would say there's correlation there. Causation, you can argue about. Hmm, that's fine. Remember our mantra. Correlation does not mean causation. Uh, <clears throat> disparate outcomes do not mean disparate uh, opportunities. Differences in climate, look at the sources of comparative advantage. Differences in climate, right? I just went over the agricultural stuff with you, so we don't need to beat that dead horse. Dif difference in factor endowments. He's reading directly from Tom Sowell. Uh, here's, Tom's, here's Tom's basic economics. I'm sure I showed it to you. Uh, if you haven't read Tom Sowell, uh, read his book, uh, Discrimination and Disparities. He talks about this very eloquently on, on how some places in the world uh, have huge advantages over others. You know, uh, why did why did Western Europe uh, develop much more quickly than, say, the Congo? Uh, well, a lot of it had to do with these things, factor endowments. Now, I, I know a lot about the Congo because I study copper as an investment. And, and the Congo's got a shitload of copper and, and other natural resources, but their productivity is so low that they, 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 they can't, and their political problems are so extreme that they're unable to unleash that power. Um, do you know that, that uh, Venezuela that is circling the toilet due to their socialist governments uh, is, has more oil Arguably, uh, oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. Um, they just can't, they can't get it to market because they uh, well they're a socialist country. Um, factor abundance is supply of factors of production relative to other factors. How many forests? Right, um, Canada can produce paper more cheaply. It's heavily forested. Factor intensity. Quantity, how much, how much labor is used compared with natural resources or machines. That's what I was talking about with productivity. So, and then we have the Heckscher Olin model, the, the country that has an abundant supply of factor of production will have a comparative advantage in goods whose production is intensive in that factor. It should be called the logic model. A greater endowment of forested land gives Canada a comparative advantage in uh, forest products. Uh, you, you may need this for your uh, dissertation. So, so, but uh, these are two very, very good uh, economists who you, you should read. Um, uh, differences in technology, uh, Swiss watches, right? Uh, these are these are again these are the sources of comparative advantage, uh, and and. Scale, uh, it, it, it re returns to scale. We, we, we talk about, well, if I have a thousand cows, I, I get a certain return to scale. It, 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 increasing returns to scale also plays a role in trade. Uh, industries get more efficient as they grow. Uh, then there will be a few large producers and production may take place in a few countries. Um, this is where me and uh, myself and Mr. Krugman are gonna differ. And when we go through the next few chapters, it's going to become 
a very stark difference uh, because anyone who knows anything about scale knows that after a certain point, size works against you and works against you badly. Um, and and uh, Sodexo, the, where I work now, it, it, it is a huge company. It, it's a 400,000 person company. It's dying. Um, an industry gets more efficient as it grows. Well, this is more of a curve. Then there'll be a few large producers. No, only it, my, in, in the Austrian way of thinking, that only will happen if uh, those producers are uh, um, get some court of, sort of government contract. Right? Production take place in a few countries. Yep. So uh, now this is, this is an example of Hong Kong. Uh, it lost its comparative advantage in garments. You may not know that. But as, as Hong Kong began to uh, do better because of uh, its, its capitalistic tendencies and free markets, uh, it lost its comparative advantage because uh, people began to demand more in wages. So they lost its comparative advantage. Why? It got better at other things, too, which, which uh, meant it was now giving up more to produce garments. So as their standard of living rose, they got better at doing other stuff. Uh, Bangladesh, of course, picked up the slack and, and uh, began to produce more that way. Supply and demand. Okay, and this is where we get to the meat of the matter. And you can see this. You're going to remember uh, comparative advantage. Right, okay, here. You're going to remember a lot of this, and it's a good refresher from the first few chapters. You can use demand and supply model to determine the effects of free trade on uh, equilibrium price and quantity um, and imports. And trade barriers. Here's where we get into it. This is this is the, the Trump deal. And I, I don't know, maybe it's going to be the Joe Biden deal. I, I, I can't imagine he won't continue some of this. Um, the effects of imports. Domestic demand shows how the quantity of a good demanded by domestic consumers depends on the price of that good. Okay, Domestic supply shows the quantity supplied. So this is in the U.S. And then you have this thing called the world price. Okay, Think of sugar. Think of something that's not produced here uh, exclusively. Here's the phone. Here's e quantity and, and price of phones. Do you realize that, that there's a company called Huawei, H-U-W-A-E-I? And you hear about it, uh, you know, uh, Trump's bitching about Hawaii or whatever is going on. I, I, I haven't paid, really paid attention to that company. It's a Chinese company. Um, Chinese is painted as a villain in, in the trade uh, wars, if you will. Um, they're not wars, but whatever they are, um, don't be uh, swayed by that. You already know about supply and demand, so th that whole argument begins to sound strange. Now, in defense of Trump, uh, this system of tariffs tariffs was has been in place since the inception of this country. So don't make the mistake of saying, oh, Trump and tariffs, and he's da 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 because you'll be full of shit. You need to research and research the history. One of the reasons that we had a civil war in this country, uh, besides the abomination of slavery, um, which was central to it, but one of the other reasons was that we had a huge problem with tariffs between the North and the South. Um, and and the, the tariffs were the way that the federal government funded itself. There was no income tax in 1865. So the tariffs were very important. And uh, the federal government decided as it grew larger and larger against the will of some people uh, in about half the country, 
it began to need more and more money. So it raised it raised tariffs on certain goods, including cotton, and uh, this was a problem. So here it is. Consumer surplus producers, all this looks familiar, simple, right? That's, that's domestic supply and demand. Well, what if the world price is lower? Here's the autarky price, meaning we take Trump's fence and we build it all the way around the damn country and nothing comes in and nothing comes out. Uh, there is no world price for anything. There's just what we produce here. Now, there will be a big argument come November about this very subject, especially since this, what I would call fraud of a pandemic, okay? We, th there's this, this idea out there that we weren't producing things in the United States that we should be. Agree or disagree, you know, we didn't have enough uh, masks and we didn't have enough of this and that and the other thing and we've got to stop depending on China for everything and la 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 we're gonna vilify you know the rest of the world now what they're talking is protectionism is one word that you should understand um, nationalism is another word that you should understand and that that has a, a, a myriad of, of uh, lexicon, you know, meanings, nationalism. It's not just, uh, uh, Nazi wasn't national, it was national socialism. Um, the, the, the long word for, for Nazi party was a national socialist party uh, or workers party. So uh, tell me they were some right wing bunch of nuts. They, the Nazis were a left wing organization. Uh, anyway, Autarky. So there's the price. And you can build a wall and, and you can be isolationist. That's another word for it. Are, are we isolationists? Uh, this is what w w was being said before we entered World War II, uh, World War I as well. Uh, we're isolationists. And that, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Um, well, I don't know. But if the world price for something is below the autarky price, you've got, look, look, look at what's going to happen. You should be at this point in your, in your economics studies, you should already know what's going to happen here. Okay. Um, when the economy is opened, imports enter, domestic price falls, PA to PW, domestic quantity demand rises, QA to QD, and domestic quantity supply falls from QA to QS. So what happens politically? This is the this is the big part of this. If you're a poli sci major or you you think you know something, what's going to happen? If you're thinking logically, when I say something to you like, we have to protect our steel workers. <laughs> what am I saying? Uh, you know, when Trump says I, we have to protect our steel workers, and he's no slouch. I, I'm sure you can find. Obama or name your lefty, you know, they're going to say, oh, we have to protect our, make a box fill in the blank, such and such workers. What they're saying is we need a tariff on imported goods so that we can protect domestic production of X, Y, or Z steel, uh, peanuts, whatever. Uh, so, Domestic quantity demand rises, domestic quantity supplied falls. The difference between the quantity demand and the quantity supplied at, at price W is filled by the imports. So if you are, and, and here's where the argument really gets sticky if, if you're a poli sci major, if you're uh, competing with China, and we have supposedly free markets here, and they have socialist markets where the government comes in and subsidizes everything. Uh, you know, they, they own the means of production, which is the textbook definition of, of, of socialism. Um, they, they own the means of production, so they don't care. They're just printing money. They don't care um, whether they're just going to compete no matter what. They're just going to lower their prices. They don't care if they take a loss. Uh, so when you're competing against a socialist country, it makes it tough, right? So here's what happens. Um, when, when, when the domestic price falls to PW, 
uh, consumers gain additional surplus, producers lose surplus, uh, gains to consumers outweigh the losses of producers, there's an increase in total surplus. That means it's good for the economy I, overall. But these producers are going to go to Washington and bitch. They're going to go and ask for a tariff. That's why there's tariffs on steel. No other reason, right? United States Steel, of which I'm looking at the stock right now. I know a lot about steel. Um, they deserve to go out of business. End of story. They've got to lower their labor cost, or they're not going to be able to compete. They've got to increase it. They, they've got to put more money into technology, or they're not going to compete. Plain and simple. So here's the domestic market with exports. It's the other side of the coin, right? Uh, here's the autarky price for whatever it is, price of a truck. Here's the uh, here's the world price. It's higher. So we're, we're going to export. We can do that. It's, it, it makes money. The economy's open to international trade. Some of the domestic supply is now exported because you make more money with it overseas. Domestic prices rise. Rises from the autarky price to the world price. As the price rises, domestic quantity demand falls. Now, of course, if you're a free market guy like me, you know what's going to happen. In either case, when, when, when this happens, we're going to have a new equilib equilibrium. Um, if, if the pr world price is higher than the real equilibrium, what will happen? It will bring more producers in, whether they be foreign producers or domestic producers. Um, they will react to uh, the price and bring more supply to the table, and, and it will balance out. Okay. So here's the same uh, kind of effects of exports on surplus, right? Same thing. Gains to producers outweigh the loss to consumer. The increase in total surplus is area Z, which is right here, right? That's what you're going to see on your uh, uh, homework. Broader effects of international trade, income distribution. Now we get into all these questions that I know I, I'm pretty sure I gave a diatribe on, on China and, and that idea of uh, if you say to yourself, well, allowing China into the world, WTO, did I say WHO? earlier in the I know I did. WHO is the World Health Organization. WTO is the World Trade Organization. The WTO um, is a, a, a crony capitalist organization. Uh, it's not even capitalist. It's just a crony organization that, you know, makes rules about trade. It's um, malarkey in my book, but whatever. Uh, we let, we, we, the WTO let uh, the Chinese begin to trade with us a number of years ago. And the, the result has been really, really good for China. Um, and I think, as I said before, I think the idea amongst academics, at least, uh, thinking people was twofold. Uh, would you give up? a certain amount of standard of living in the United States in order to give the Chinese a chance to flourish and their middle class to grow in order that there might be political change in that country. That sounds complicated, but think about it carefully. Um, if, if we allow trade with, it, we did allow trade with China and what, what uh, the isolationists, um, Trump, would say is no 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 we did too much we and, and you know his it's all the art of the deal with him you know we didn't make a good enough deal to protect american jobs uh, the way we should have so he tends to make villains out of the chinese but make no mistake this was a policy and a policy with ramifications and, and they were moral ramifications they were not just um mechanical economic, you know, this is why the Austrian way of thinking appeals to me so much because for all the Krugmans of the world who say they care about people, 
It's the Austrians are going, no, 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 wait, let's open up markets and everyone will benefit. This is the best way to raise people out of poverty, open markets. Um, and and I, I still believe that and uh, I, I can show it empirically. So uh, broader effects on international trade is income distribution, meaning uh, more people get wealthy. Right? What he's saying is, what Krugman is saying in this right here is that free markets create wealth. That's what it says. Um, Import competing, produce goods and services that, that can be imported, with these two things. Uh, and then we have, uh, does the combination of one growing import and labor intensive products from newly industrialized economies and two, the export of high technology good causes a widening weight gap between highly educated and less well-educated U.S. workers. You see, he, you know, he hits on what happened uh, and, and that is true. So. When you start to argue about wage gaps, um, this is what you're arguing about. And if you argue with me, I'm going to talk to you about Price's Law. I'm going to talk to you about the Pareto Principle. And I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, Matthew's Law, right? Uh, so when both of the, all those things you should look up. Price's Law, the Pareto Principle, right? Why, when we play Monopoly, does somebody end up with all the money every time? You know, that's that's not it's not a theory. It's been proven over and over. Uh, nobody nobody can anyway. But what happens is you get this widening uh, widening between educated and well educated, uh, highly educated and less well educated U.S. workers. You get this you get this widening of the gap. Um, that's what happens. And that's ugly, and nobody wants to talk about it, except me. <laughs> the economy has free trade uh, when the government does not attempt either to reduce or to increase levels of export, exports and imports that occur naturally. Um, policies that limit imports are known as trade protection or simply as protection. A tariff is a tax levied on imports. So we taxed imports in this country in order that um, we funded the government on tariffs, tax levied on other countries. And, and in the beginning, individual states had tariffs on other states. Uh, this is one of the problems with the post-revolutionary uh, war, the War of Secession from England, that, that war post uh, between the Articles of Confederation and the U.S. Constitution, one of the problems that we're having was all the tariffs between states. Um, and that's arguably the, the birth of the Commerce Clause um, in, in the U.S. Constitution. That's what it's there for. Tariffs. So it's an easy way to, uh, you know, protect your workers and raise money. So tariff is a tax. Tariff has two effects, increase in domestic production, reduction in domestic consumption. Why? You put a tariff on something, it's a, it's a tax. It's just like when we study taxes, it's the same thing. If you would add a tax to gasoline, what are you going to get? You're going to get less driving. We just went over this. You want less, you want less hydrocarbons in the air or CO2, if that's the bad thing. Then you raise, you raise the tax on gas. Raise it $100. Nobody will drive, right? Um, I don't know if anybody got to this, but when you tax gas, you know who you tax? Poor people. That's who you tax. Because the poor people are zoned out of Aspen. They're down in Rifle, right? In our little valley. Rifle's an hour away from their work. You're taxing. the. It is a regressive tax. It's a terrible tax. So... You've got to you've got to balance your environmentalism with your hate for the poor. No, nobody hates the poor, right? But it's the same thing with with all of this discussion of climate change. Are you going to tax coal when everybody in the world needs coal to get electricity? No one wants to talk about that. They just want to say, "Oh, well, the planet's going to explode." Well, maybe it isn't. And maybe you're just killing a bunch of people in the Congo because you got to have this tax on coal. 
I mean, it's not quite so easy. These, these subjects are very, very difficult. Um, so having knowledge is good. And if you want, if, if you want to know something about environmentalism, you should know about the environmental Kuznets curve. K-U-Z-N-E-T. Kuznet was, was a very good economist who drew a curve, and, and the curve was that uh, in the environmental end of things is as company, as countries uh, gross domestic product and standard of living rises, their, their ability to pollute or their, their want to pollute it decreases. And so the idea behind Kuznets, uh, uh, one way of interpreting Kuznets' work is to say that if we can lift everyone out of poverty through free markets, you will have a better planet faster than doing it your way through force. Because if you begin to force people, they will rebel and you will have a mess. Um, you might have the Soviet Union, uh, which was a real mess. Um, environmentally and every other way. Just but forget about the hundred million bodies they piled up uh, to the cause of, of the utopia. Tariff pushes up the price. There it goes, right? Price with the tariff is up here. The world price is down here. Uh, reduces quantity demand and increases domestic quantity supplied. So by now, you know, you, you just have a feel for this. I, I hope that, you know, this is why I urge you to keep your first economics book. Get it in print. You know, go out and buy one. Get one used so that you can pick this up and go, okay, what should I think about this when Trump or someone else says tariffs, we should do this. You can pull this out and go, well, it's not quite so simple. Let's think about this. Okay, so what do we create? Consumer surplus, A plus B plus C plus D. Um, these are the changes. Uh, producer surplus is A, right? So th it, it reduces consumer surplus, increases producer surplus, creates new government revenue, and creates what? Dead weight loss. Dead weight loss. Well, what's the dead weight loss? It's right here. Um, it, it's, it's not a real market. It's a phony market. Import quota is a legal limit of a quantity of good that can be imported. So what's the difference between a quota and a, and a tariff? Nothing. It's the same as a tariff, except instead of government revenue, uh, quota rents will go to quota license holders, usually foreigners. You know, so we're going to import X amount of ivory or something, and and uh, quota rents are, are, are the idea. Now, and also as you can see, with an import quota, what would you have? Well, you'd have black markets, and you and and you'd have corruption um, of all kinds. Black markets being one form of corruption. Um, so trade protection in the United States. Now the United States has very low tariffs, which is increased benefit of trade, um, right? And and that's a good thing, you know. So if you if you're thinking that um, the whole trend, this is up to 2013, of course. It, so they've risen from there, but how much and on what is a, is a whole other question. Um, if you've if you get a chance, uh, look into something like NAFTA, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. It's it, the document takes up um, more space than my desk. It, it's a giant document with a, de a specific deal for every company. Um, it's crazy. So if if you're of the ilk that again that thinks that Trump's the only guy that ever messed around with tariffs, you're dead wrong. Uh, read some history, learn. National security, oh, this is just crap, oh my god. Why do we have trade protection? Well, we need steel in the United States in case we got to build tanks and beat Hitler again. And, uh, you know, Jesus, come on. Um, I don't believe in standing armies. I don't believe in uh, any, I'm, I'm a liberal. I, I, in that regard, I'm, I'm a libertarian. I don't think I think the Constitution says what it says, that there shouldn't be a standing army. And again, we just had this discussion about police. And my argument goes something like this. 
If you allow government to adjudicate how many police there are or to bureaucratize the police force, you will have too many police. And if you have an oversupply of police, you're going to have some bad consequences. That was my argument, and, and it's, I can defend that argument pretty well. I can also defend it, right, it, with a standing army or, or military, in that if you have a standing military, the government will tend to use it for political purposes and, and not for defense, which is what it was des designed for. So um, <laughs> national security, if you talk to a libertarian, they're going to they're gonna really push back uh, on this one. Uh, the United States must be able to rely on key domestic industries. You know, we have a hole in the ground where w they pump oil out of the ground in Saudi Arabia, and we pump it back into the ground in the United States. It's called the Strategic Oil Reserve. Look it up. It's one of the most absurd things I've ever heard of. But it, that's what we do uh, so that we have oil in case, again, you know, Stalin uh, starts talking about it, shows up again, uh, you know, Communism rears its ugly head, um, which, uh, you know, communism is pretty much dead, except for places like uh, North Korea, uh, Cuba. Steel, defense, yeah, as national security. Food, right? That, that was the big one. That's why we socialized the entire food chain in the United States. Um, as you know, since the uh, Agricultural Act of 1934, 33, um, you if you produce milk you don't you you don't put your milk out in the market they set the price for it in Washington um so it was part of the argument for doing that 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 Roosevelt that scoundrel came up with was that we needed to have a good food supply in case we went to war again um at the time i'm sure that felt like the thing to do uh, but I, in, now that we've run that experiment for a number of years, those of you who are locavores or um, believe in sustainability, you ought to take a good look at, and you think that capitalism has failed agriculture, you're wrong. And not just a little wrong, very wrong. The agricultural system in this country um, has not been a free market system since 1930s. So go look at the history. And if you want to point out why there's giant farms or, or what do you want to co company farms or corporate farming? The reason there is, is because of government intervention, not because of free markets. Um, Production is required even during peacetime to ensure their availability, right? So that's the argument. That's the argument for trade protection. Now, now that the, uh, there's the girls. Hi, girls. Hi. What are you doing? We're looking for my iPad. Did you did you move the goats? Mm -hmm. That's my girl. We're having a goat issue. That's Gianna and Alice. Wave. <laughs> Wave. Okay. Let me finish up here, ladies. No. So that's what you're going to hear in this election. You're going to hear these uh, trade protection arguments. And, and uh, I'm sure uh, Mr. Trump, at least, is going to be beating that drum. We'll see about Mr. Biden. I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to be true. I'm, uh, I don't know what to expect from the Democrats. I, I'm still astonished by who they're running. and <laughs> That's my opinion. <laughs> I thought that the, within, within that, I was telling Dad this morning, within that group of candidates in, in the Democrat, on the Democratic ticket, there were some, I mean, Andrew Yang, uh, who, who we talked about a little bit on the, uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, basic income, you know, guaranteed basic income or whatever you call that. Um, there were some really good people. I, I thought Kamala Harris was great. I'm, I'm not a real fan of uh, some of them on the left, I, I, but uh, there were some level-headed people there. And yet uh, the corruption in the Democratic Party is only equal to the stupidity in the Republican Party. So they come up with Joe Biden and I'm like, really? That's, I'll tell you what, though, I am watching the debates, if there are any. They're going to be fun. Uh, which, one's, which one is strongest? This is one of those practice questions that would make you crazy. Uh, trade reduces the number of jobs in the United States and should therefore be limited. To me, the answer is no. As a free market guy, 
it's wrong to trade with companies that use child labor. Uh, no, that's wrong. Child labor is good. And <laughs> I can feel people freaking out right now. Child labor is good. It's good. Did you hear me? Um, because in those countries that no one wants to send their kids to work. Don't be silly. Uh, but if you're in a country where it, there is aching poverty and you need child labor to get to feed your family, that's what you need to do. Um, and, and the only way to pull those countries out of abject poverty may be a period of child labor and, and so that they, they can get to a place economically where they can stop it. Nobody wants it, but, but they, it, it's a necessary thing in, in places. So when, when you, you know, uh, rail against child labor in other, other countries, be very careful because the unintended consequence of your policy of no child labor in the world could very well be the death of children. So think it through uh, and, and look at the history. Uh, the child labor laws in the United States didn't end child labor. Um, capitalism ended child labor. You know, the, the increase in gross domestic product and the standard of living ended child labor, except here at the Cleaver House, where we believe in it. Yeah, we need, I'm kidding, Jesus. We need to keep some industries for reasons of national security. Uh, steel, you know, I mean, all these come to mind. Like the nuclear industry, whoa, God, let's... Let's keep that one under wraps. You, know, you, you could see the, uh, the the debate coming. We need to protect certain industries while they develop. This is the greatest crock of shit ever developed, uh, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, what did what did survey says? Uh, well, this this has no answer, <laughs> as you can see. NAFTA countries care about uh, one another's trade policies, international trade agreements, treaties, and and, and which. A country promises to reduce, reduce import tariffs in return for promise to do the same. Um, some of these can work out. The problem is governments. That's the problem. Um, if you started a government like ours, and uh, um, unfortunately, we didn't foresee this trouble. And uh, um, the, the founders came from a system of mercantilism at, at, under the crown. And so a lot of that was left over, and I can show you an article about this. Uh, Marie Rothbard wrote some really interesting things about it. But they didn't know how else to fund the government, uh, so that's what they did. Oh, is it a bad idea? Um, EU. Oh, God, don't get me going on the EU. Uh, the only good... No, well, anyway, it's, it's just a terrible organization. The worst. Um, if, you want, if you want to listen to somebody on the EU... Uh, Daniel Henninger. Thank God Britain finally got out. They were smart, um, which had no effect on their, their, what a joke that is. Oh, Brexit's going to cause calamity. What a crock of shit. <laughs> they made all the same deals. Whatever. Like they were never going to be able to trade again without their, you know, the, 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 people in Brussels. That's BS. Brussels is where, uh, the EU is, uh, where the the European Union's uh, central authority is in Brussels. WTO, I mentioned before, overseas international trade agreements. You can see by this that I'm against. <laughs> they over, I don't care. Why would I want to belong to that organization? It could only be a disastrous bureaucracy. Uh, and turns out it is. What do you know? Um but you may think it's the greatest thing ever, and I, you're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> we disagree. <laughs> I still love you. Um, so, new challenges. Uh, Kelly just spent two and a half hours on, on the phone with AT&T. Um, we may not be with them much longer, uh, but they outsourced all of their phone rooms, and um, it's not. I don't. It's not good. <laughs> it's, well, she's not happy. Uh, is that a good thing, a bad thing? I think I think it can be done right. I, I'm pretty sure AT&T is not doing it right. But again, AT&T is a, a government bureaucracy. It's a, it, They've gotten licensure. We're going to talk about monopoly in the next few chapters, and I have a blast with that. But um, those are so highly regulated, the phone companies, that 
they, they, they're not a free market. Um, so they don't give a shit about their customers. They don't care. Um, so new the, the globalization inequality when wealthy countries like the United States export skill intensive products like aircraft while importing labor intensive products like clothing. Um, you're going to see more of a wage gap. We, we, we uh, uh, talked about that and it's true. Um, the problem is uh, the bell curve does not change. So there is not what, what Bill Clinton gave a, oh my God, he gave a speech. I was just, I was appalled by this speech when he talked about how the United States was going to be the, the service country for the world. And, and it was this arrogant kind of like, you know, we're America, so we're smarter than everybody. That's like, no, IQ is a distribution, and we're going to leave a lot of people out if we go down this road. So when you when you outsource, uh, when you import labor intensive products like clothing, um, you you you're going to get rid of jobs here that we need because we're not all the same. We're not all the same. We're not all the same. You hear that? We're not all the same. Oh my God. Um, offshore outsourcing, hiring people in another country. We just talked about that. Uh, still relatively small compared uh, with the traditional trade. Um, but we notice uh, tariffs result in what? Uh, one and two, or two and three, producer and, and government revenue. Producer surplus government revenue. Remember? Um, and they want you to remember that. So that's, that is my, my give and take on this subject. Um, the, the history, economic history of the United States is fascinating. Uh, here's what I was talking about, and, and then I'll let you go. I've been going for an hour and 12 minutes. But um, this, this is an article I just got today, and it caught my eye. Uh, Rothbard's Challenging History of the Revolutionary War and Constitution. It's not quite the declaration, um, but here's, I assume this is Cornwallis uh, surrendering to Washington. But nonetheless, um, right here, to, to, to the first section of the book, this is a book called Conceived in History by, by Murray Rothbard, uh, deals with the so-called critical period in U.S. history. After the war had ended, Rothbard quickly disposes of the common belief, both at the time and among some historians, that the post-war economic hardships in the United States, post-revolutionary war, were due to excessive importation of inexpensive British goods. Right? So what was happening? Right? All, these, all these British goods were coming in, and we weren't making anything here. So jobs problems, right? We didn't have a, a robust industrial base yet. Anticipating the more recent findings of economic historians, the at, attributes of these hardships partly to the fact that after the war ended, the U.S. faced all the mercantilist restrictions that Britain applied to other foreign countries. When the colonies were still inside the empire, the empire meaning England, they were hindered by some of these restrictions, but aided by others. Consequently, Britain had been the colony's major trading partner, and the independence forced a painful reorientation of American trade. Get it? Right? You, now you've got some tools. You could start thinking about what happened here. This in turn created pressures from merchants and artisans for a more powerful government that could retaliate with navigation laws protecting American shipping and tariffs protecting American manufacture. That's the first thing they thought of. Not free trade. They thought it, they thought they'd screw the next guy, you know, and that's that's human nature. So um, economic history is always is is such a good way to get these concepts down by looking at history. If you're having difficulty with the concepts, apply them to what occurred, and that's that is the beautiful thing about uh, human action and and. Uh, about this book, and uh, you know, it's it's. Let's see what happened, not what we think is going to happen. Let's stop modeling and start studying what ha what what really happens. Okay, with that, I'll let you go.